All right, well, God bless you and welcome to Live with Brad Sullivan. It's such a joy to have you tuned in tonight. Thank you for taking time out of your Thursday night to join us here for this live discussion. We're so delighted that you've tuned in and we're very excited to have my close and dear friend, Pastor Steve Kelly of the Wave Church in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Pastor Steve is in the virtual house tonight. Come on, somebody. And so we're delighted to have you with us, Pastor Steve. It's so good to be with you, Brad. And this is not the Mutual Admiration Society, but my wife and I love you guys. We love your church, and we are so honored to call you a friend. Hey, we feel the same about you, Pastor. We love you guys so much, your leadership, your your um, uh, your voice, your leadership voice, your ministry, its impact, and that's why we're so delighted to be in association with you guys at what you're doing there at, at Wave Church. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we love you guys. Go Red Tides. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Roll See? Tide. That's See, right. That, you got to work on it. I knew as soon as I said it was wrong, because my son Josh is a major Bama fan. He is. And, and I, as soon as I said Red Tides, I went, no, that's wrong. Did you hear my hesitancy in that? That's okay. But you, your heart was in the right place, though. That's the main thing. Okay. <laughs> if your heart is willing, that's a good start. Hard is willing, you know, and so uh, we don't want to alienate all the Auburn fans that are watching. Still, please stay tuned, but you know, <laughs> come on, hold tight anyway. So, hey, uh, I'm a pro sport fan, I love sport, that's right, absolutely. And uh, you know, if you don't know, Pastor Steve has the coolest Australian accent. I mean, come on, that right <laughs> there, stand that, that that makes you stand out. So, uh we're so glad to, uh, to have you, Pastor Steve. And for those of you who don't know Pastor, as we said earlier, he's the lead pastor, a head pastor of Wave Church, and uh, he oversees many Wave campuses, outreach ministries, leadership college, leadership network, the list goes on. He's a powerful leadership voice and a voice of influence, and we're so delighted to have him tonight with us on this discussion. And if you'd like more information about Pastor Steve and Wave Church, go to wavechurch.com, I believe it is, Pastor. Right. right, wavechurch.com, and uh, if you like yep. more information about our ministry, it's bradsullivan.org or surgechurch.tv, and uh, uh, Pastor, we wanted to have you on tonight to talk about a series that you did recently in your church titled Unmasking David, and we just, yeah. you know, David is one of the most fascinating characters of the entire Bible. Uh, yeah. I was thinking about him today, you know, of course, as a minister, as a preacher, my gosh, how many messages have we preached that that and go around uh, there that involves something to do with David, his life, yeah. one of the moments of his life. But I was thinking, you know, he's one of the, the, I think one of the reasons why he's the most fascinating character of the Bible pastor is because there's so many elements to his personality. You know, it's like he's a, a master commander, a fierce warrior, valiant in battle, yet also very tender, passionate lover of God, a praiser, unabashed worshiper, dancer before God. Uh, I mean, he was a poet, inventor of musical instruments. I mean, I don't know what else a guy could have achieved in his life. And that makes him someone that I think is we should try to glean as much information and learn from as possible. Well, and uh, let me add to your list. He was a mercenary. He was an outlaw. He was a fugitive. <laughs> he was a extortionist. He, I mean, um, the list goes on and on. And I think one of the challenges we face in church life is we have this picture of David being at least in children's ministry. And we grew up with this paradigm of him slaying Goliath, which he did. Mm -hmm. But yet the only picture we have of David was he took down a giant and that's a true story. But there is so much more to the real story of who King David is um, that we could almost diminish David to a photograph rather than movie That's of good. who David really was. That's good. Right. You know, I think one of the things that's interesting, Pastor, is as you're saying, uh, I was just thinking today about, and, and I know we're going to have this discussion, just thinking about David, was is that um, he stands out so much not only because of his accomplishments, but is the span of time of his life that the Bible includes. You know, even you know, like Joseph, there you see him as a teenager and you see his life unfold. But for David, it's from his youth to his old age and all the points in between. There's really a huge span of his life and reign. 
uh, in, that the Bible includes, and it's the mountains and the valleys, the successes and uh, the failures, and, uh, and uh, you know, it, it really relates to real life and for people. You know, Brad, I think to me, that is one of the greatest challenges. Like, let's just take the book of Acts. We read the book of Acts, and we read it from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter, what is it, 28 or 30 chapters, and we almost think that those, those chapters are encapsulated in one reading, yet they were actually over 30 years, mm -hmm. 10 decades. Right. But if we're not careful, we can, exp we, people say, we need to get back to the early church. And I'm going, okay, the early church was the book of Acts. It took place over 30 years. And we could say, we want everything that was in the book of Acts happen in a day. And the truth is it was over 30 years. And I think the same is true about David. I think we can look at David in a photograph and go, we need to be that person in a day. Yet the, the whole story of King David is encapsulated in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Chronicles, and then throughout Kings and many different, like the whole book of Psalms. And I think we could almost miss the entirety over David's life because we are in a social media generation, which is capture everything in a moment. And yet we, if we're not careful, we can really miss the real spirit of what God's trying to teach us. Yes, sir. That's true. And uh, you know, the book of Acts, it actually, you know, you'll see like an Acts chapter, I think it was six when they had, uh, there was that division that was coming in the church and the seven men stood up led by Stephen. That was the first, that was the first um, progress report given of the early church, the first of five actually, that was in, in 10 year, I think it was like 10 year spans. And so, yeah, you know, it's, I think it's David proves and the early church proves throughout the book of Acts that, uh, you know, we have to just be faithful every day and, yeah. uh, you know, to the highs and lows. And uh, I think through COVID and through uh, 2020, uh -huh. Just stay faithful, you know, just get yeah. up, be faithful, go to bed and do it all over again the next day. You know, um, Brett, if you'll permit me, sure. I actually, I was thinking about the early days and I kind of did this teaching as you referred to the unmasking of David. And I want to say I'm taking no credit. Uh, well, I'm not taking all credit for mm -hmm. what I'm about to say, because there's a guy called Dr. Dr. Mark Rutland who right. wrote a book. Um, about King David, and there's not the only book I've read. Um, and I majored on David um, back in 1983. Um, were you born in 1983, Brad? You know what? I was, Pastor. I was born in 1975. I am. I'm 44, about to be 45. I shouldn't even say but, that live on Facebook. But, look, 35, man. It's amazing. You, you <laughs> look so young. I get so annoyed when I mention 1983, how many people in our church were, weren't even born in that year. I kind of had to pause for a moment there. My, but, my, my youngest son, Sydney, he's like, dad, back in the old days in the eighties, when you were, when you were a kid, I'm like, shut up. Uh, yeah, I know you just, yeah. <laughs> so I majored on um, David. I majored on the book of Acts. I majored on old Testament characters and my church, my choice was King David. And I just think in the early days in my teaching of our church about unmasking David, not just telling the children's ministry flannel chart of David taking down a giant, but the early days, God spoke to David through the prophet Samuel. And he said, you will be king. And yet we all know it was actually at least 18 years later from when Samuel anointed Jesse's son right. to be that he actually became the king of Judah and then eventually king of all of Israel. That's right. And I talk about in this uh, teaching, which is your, what I think you're referring to, about this idea of waiting, this idea of, um, you know, everything doesn't happen in a moment. Mm -hmm. And I wrote down, like, can you imagine the torment for David? And I don't mean torment in a bad way, but the sense of, I, I call it this, I call the moment of anointing to the moment, well, actually the moment of um, anointing David to be king of Israel. And then between that, there's anguish. And then there's the final 
um, incarnation, the coronation um, of David to become the king. And I thought, why does God give us a vision of what's in our future and call us to give us a picture of what God's called us to? And then he teaches us to hurry up and wait. That's right. And I think there's five, so, some five reasons why God teaches us to wait. I talk about this. Number one, waiting. I love this thought reveals our real motives mm -hmm. that actually God, I, I talked to a business guy today, just in our church. And uh, he's about to take over a major company. I can't say publicly what that company is, but it's a major company. And uh, he's about to become the, the, the owner of this company. And he, he wrote down his vision from years ago that he wanted to one day become this guy. And now I'm sitting with him today wow. having lunch and it's going, pastor, it's about to happen. And I said, what's it like been from the moment you had the vision for it to the moment of today? And uh, I think waiting reveals our real motives. It's true. Uh, people with wrong motives won't stay around. This is very true. So I, it, you look at David, the prophet comes, you'll be the king of Israel. Oh, by the way, there's going to be 18 years of hell between now and then. And then secondly, waiting actually builds patience mm -hmm. in our lives. And anything that's worth uh, waiting for, anything that God requires patience. And I, I think that's so important. We must get a sense of God's timing. And then thirdly, and I'm, forgive me, I'm referring to my notes here. Yeah, good. Uh, I love this thought. Waiting builds anticipation. Man. I know that you, but I grew up when, it, when my birthday was coming up. I was so excited about it. It's only 20 more, more days to my birthday or maybe Christmas. Um, and there's a Christmas present, whatever. Waiting builds anticipation. I think God teaches us to wait because the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Mm -hmm. And sense of waiting, like a, uh, my daughter is... Um, six weeks, um, be, uh, well, she's due to have a baby in six weeks. I promise you, she's waiting. And there's a sense of anticipation for this little baby. Right. And, and waiting, I think, develops character. Right. And there's no doubt. Like, you think of Joseph. God told Joseph, one day the sun and the moon and the stars, it's all going to bow and worship you. But David, and that, that really, sorry, David, uh, Joseph, God said, I'm going to make you a leader of the known world. Mm -hmm. And yet, yet, even though God gave Joseph that dream, he proved he wasn't yet leadership material because he went around telling everybody his dream. That's right. And Joseph had to go through, uh, you know, his own family turning on him. Mm -hmm. He had to go through the pit. He had to go through slavery. He had to go through prison. And then in a day, 18 years later, from what I understand, Joseph went from the, uh, from the empty well to the palace. Right. And so he had to wait to get a sense of God's timing. I think that's so important. There's a huge and learning I, curve in those days. What's that? There's a huge learning curve, you know, in those days of obscurity and waiting. Uh, you know, like for Joseph, he had to, he was going to be the man, he was going to manage the empire. So in Potiphar's house, he learned how to manage, you know, resources. And in yep. prison, he learned how to manage people. Two of yep. the skills that he would need to be the governor of, of, of Egypt. And that was, uh, but it's that waiting. If you don't take advantage of who you are, where you are, you'll never be able to stand in the place. You know, you are where you are. It's not your final address, but you have to take advantage of where you are while you're going where God's called you to be, to learn the things you need to learn to be prepared for that time. That is so, and think about this. Um, I mean, you and I, Brad, we know it's like we're pastors of churches and we have people who are aspirational about their dreams, right. about the ministry. And there's a big difference between um, creating a demand for your leadership versus demanding to be a leader. Exactly. And, and, and no doubt Joseph created a dem everywhere he went he created a demand the bible talks about what he was in laban's house laban have i got that right no that's jacob out of his house, out of his house. That's right. um that everything this guy did was so good that potiphar promoted him right. so he was so good at what he did 
he created a demand for, he didn't demand to be a leader. And then he got thrown in prison and the prison warden said, you are so good at what you do. I'll put you in charge of everything. Mm -hmm. So he created a demand for his leadership versus, you know, what it's like when some people demand for you and I to recognize them. And that's the waiting process, being faithful in the little and God will promote, promote you ever much. I always tease pastor, you know, uh, just over the years growing up in church, you know, you see people who want recognition. They want to be, they want to achieve a certain title. They want this thing or that, and they want to be on the platform. And I was a pastor's kid. You know, when you're a pastor's kid, you're free labor. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you are. I tell people, I'm like, man, I was pastoring the grass long before I ever pastored people. And when I finally did, and I did so many behind the scenes things. When I finally did make it to the stage, I was over in the corner playing drums, you know, it was long before I ever got a microphone in my hand. Or... Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the thought like David, that, that from the moment that Samuel came and anointed him and said, you'll be the King of Israel. I, I got this thought about keep doing what you're skilled at and let God do the promoting. Amen. That's good. So here comes this prophet and says, you will be the king of all of Israel. And think, Brad, I often think about this. I think about David, about how that um, Saul was tormented by an evil spirit. Mm -hmm. But the reputation of David was, we need to get a musician to help soothe this evil spirit. And David was so good at his musicianship mm -hmm. that the reputation of this young boy made it to the king's tent. And they said, get him and get him to bring, um, you know, his instrument and play. And the Bible says that when David came, he soothed the evil spirit. Now think about that. He went there knowing that this prophet said, you'll be king. And in that moment of Saul's torment, he could have run a sword through Saul and said, well, the prophet said this is going to happen. But he didn't do that. He was just faithful. And, and in the skill that God had given him and, and sued the evil spirit, he could have said, hey, well, the prophet said, I'm going to be king. This is my chance to take him out. And then another occasion, Saul, who was trying to kill David, crept into a cave and David cut off a corner of his robe right. and David could have run him through. And yet he said, I'm going to let God do the promoting. Mm -hmm. I'll just do what I'm good at, but I want to take this man out. And we see people pushing for ministry, mm -hmm. pushing for success and trying to make it happen on their terms. Yet David would not let, allow himself or anyone else to touch him. And the final one, he goes into Saul's camp mm -hmm. and takes Saul's spear and Saul's, wa Saul's water bottle. And Saul, one more time, says, David, David, I'm so sorry. And it just shows me that actually I'm just going to be good at what I do. And I'll let God promote me. What a principle that that is, you know. And I think if you if you look at David's story, one of the last great tests that he had to pass in that waiting period, you know, God has His own waiting room to, and yeah. uh, in the waiting room of God, you know, one of the last uh, tests he had to pass there was when you're talking about those instances where in the cave in the Engedi there in in the Judean wilderness, you know, he had his men prophesying to him, telling him that this yeah. is. This is the moment that God's given you to take, you know, you have to let a prophetic word play out, you know, you, wow. it, has to, it has to live itself out. And that's why the waiting is so important. And, um, you know, when you take, uh, take, uh, take things into your own hands to try to make a word come to pass, that's when you make the mistakes. And he had these guys prophesying to him saying, you know what, this is God giving you in, it's all into your hands. But I, I think that one of the, one of the things I've always, loved about that passage pastor is the fact that he david's it's like he said to himself i would rather have to hide out in caves longer to have it god's way than to try to take things into my into my own hands to make right. give myself the position and i think today in, in life in ministry uh people want to seize uh you know a title or, or or the positions instead of you know what serve your way into it and if god's got that on your life it's going to come to pass if you'll just be faithful uh, in, in, in that waiting room. Now, you, I like what, I've never heard that phrase before, proffer lying. <laughs> yes, sir. There's prophesying and there's proffer lying. And those guys, wow. were, they were proffer lying to him. 
And uh, that's the danger. You know, you've got to make sure, you know, that you're around voices of wisdom and experience, not just people that'll tell you what you want to hear to get you where you want to go. Uh, and Brad, I love that. I love that. It makes me think about, you know, finally when the Amalekite who killed Saul, mm -hmm. uh, David had the opportunity to kill him, but he wouldn't because he was just being faithful. What God gave him is skilled mm -hmm. and let God do the promoting. David wrote promotion doesn't come from the South, the East or the West or the, or the West. It comes from God. God is the judge. Right. And David asked that Amalekite, why didn't the fear of God stop you from killing the man that God anointed? And David killed him and avenged Saul's death. And then I think about Aaron and Miriam. When Moses, the Bible says, they said, well, who's Moses? Doesn't the Lord also speak for us? And they tried to um, anoint themselves. And God said, why didn't the fear of me stop you from touching the Lord's anointed? And David knew something that even though these other people, well-intentioned, good motives, David, we know that you're anointed to be king. And sometimes if we have the wrong voices in our lives, mm -hmm. um, we can miss God. I, I actually had this thought about, um, you know, David had that moment where he was given Ziglag and he could have settled for less. Well, maybe this is what God meant, but he wouldn't let God, he wouldn't settle for less. He goes, no, I know God's called me to be the king of Israel. And sometimes we settle for good versus God's best. Amen. And then I have this thought, David is finally anointed to become king. And um, he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. This is one of the most important strategic leadership moments that David makes in his leadership tenure. And he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat of God, that which was given to Moses that... Um, and he, and he brings it and he's bringing it into Jerusalem. And the Bible says that, um, if I got it right, is it um, Azza that reaches his hand? Yeah, he reaches out to um, stop it from falling, catch it. Yeah. And it was actually brought in, listen, on a Philistine oxen cart. It was an oxen cart made by the Philistines. The Philistines were an enemy to the purposes of God. Right. It goes to show that we cannot bring the presence of God on things that are given to us by the world. That's good. Amen. Then Azza, in his desire, because the, the, the oxen stumbled, the, mm -hmm. the cart looked like it, the Ark of the Covenant was going to fall off the cart. And Azza genuinely reached out his hand to stop the Ark from falling off the cart. And here's the thought I've got. We can't prop God up. Amen. And sometimes I see, you know, Brad, you do too. Celebrity preachers trying to be accepted by the world and right. making God more palatable, more acceptable to secular society. And we try to prop God up. We try to, and God in a moment took us out and said, I don't need you to prop me up. I don't need you to defend me. I am who I am. Amen. And I think that's such a great leadership principle that we can learn. And of course, we know the story. David went, what happened there? And left the Ark of the Covenant at Obadiah's house um, for at least three months and just tried to figure out, figure out what did he do wrong? Man who wasn't even Jewish, by the way. <laughs> yes. No, that's exactly right. But he was so touched by the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, that when David finally brought the Ark, brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, um, which in and of itself was a major accomplishment, um, that Obadiah literally moved his house, his family, wife, and kids into Jerusalem because mm -hmm. one touch of the presence of God mm -hmm. will change you forever mm -hmm. and you will build your life around that. And he actually, I think, Pastor became a gatekeeper at, he David, did. Tab at the tabernacle. So, I mean, and it, not just a gatekeeper, a musician, a singer, an usher. And right. actually, if you read it, he actually became a priest. Right. Now, I don't all that means because um, you have to be Jewish, but he obviously converted to the Jewish culture to become that. Right. Yeah. Well, praise God. You know, it, it's the, 
the thing, you know, we're, you're talking, we're talking about prophecy and versus prophesying and waiting on God. You know, when I was a, a lot younger pastor, <laughs> I received a word of prophecy. I was a young, I was young in the ministry, and this guy, and I received this powerful word of prophecy, and it was that that God's going to take you the long way around. You know, have you ever got one of those words where you're like, you know, I'd really just rather you had kept that one and not even shared it. You know, it's yes, it's kind of like I don't know to be encouraged or discouraged, but it's like God's going to take you the long way around the mountain. He said, but there's going to be times that you're going to feel like this can't be God's way, but if you'll yeah. just stay faithful and and do it God's way, God will give you an anointing more than just a talent. And I think that a lot of times um, people in leadership or people, uh, you know, this is apply to practical life or in ministry, but you want to just try to jump the gun to see something out of your talent level. But what's going to sustain you is when you uh, possess that based upon the anointing that's on your life, because that will carry you further. It's kind of like when David was brought out of the sheep field, he was already talented, but the anointing touched those talents. And that was the difference maker. Wow. So I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking when you said that a couple of thoughts, burden does not necessitate, sorry, let me start again. Burden does not necessitate timing. Amen. Just God's That's giving you a burden for something. doesn't mean you're supposed to act on it right then and there. That's right. There's something about waiting and then make sure your gifting doesn't take you somewhere where your character mm -hmm. can that's right and, and don't be enamored with your own success because i i got this great thought in this i'm asking david and you know brad you and i are building the kingdom of god we're encouraging people uh men and women to resource the vision mm -hmm. of the kingdom of god and sometimes you get people who are blessed and have means and I, I think about this moment in David's life, and this is to me, I, um, there's so much I want to unpack in this, but this is the thing I want to say. David said, when he brought the Ark of the Covenant, now keep in mind, a prophet came and said, one day you were the king of Israel, and 18 years of a fugitive, of a mercenary, of a outlaw, mm -hmm. and running from his life, mm -hmm. Saul trying to kill him, and then finally the day comes, when he does become the king and then he brings the Ark of the Covenant and he thinks to himself, you know, I'm looking at, and, and the Bible says that David looked at his house and how palatial it was and how beautiful and opulent. And he said, look what all I've accomplished. Look at all I've done. And he said to Samuel, mm -hmm. I have it in my heart. Look what I've done. Now I want to build God a house. That's and right. he goes, the ark of the, the presence of God has been intense. And he goes, I want to do this for God. And the prophet, even the great prophet Samuel, made a mistake and goes, have at it. But that night, God speaks to Samuel and goes, no, 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 no. You go back and tell David, it was me who brought you out of the pasture. It was me who blessed you. It was me who anointed you. It was me who promoted you. And you think you are going to build me a house no i did all this for you and god was saying to david it's not that i don't like the fact that you want to build me a house mm -hmm. but you think you're going to build me a house i've built your life and god was saying to david you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself mm -hmm. stop thinking it was all what you want to do for me right. it's what i've done through you amen but I do love his heart, though, like a, almost like yep. a good lawyer pastor. He found a loophole. He still raised an amazing offering for the construction of the temple, even in death. You know, I mean, it was amazing. What do you what do you he's like, God, you won't let me build a house, but I'm going to make sure my son has everything he needs to build it. You're absolutely actually David resourced the building of that house. He provided of his own funds, of his own personal wealth, out of his kingship, out of his leadership. And you're absolutely right. So David's, you know, I think his heart was right. But there was this sense in which all of us have to make sure we don't think, look what I've done for God versus well, look what the Lord's done through me. Amen. Amen. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, we just want to encourage, if you're watching right now and you've been in a season of discouragement, I mean, come on, 2020 has been discouraging enough, but let's focus on the encouraging part. And that is God is still God. He's still faithful. 
and he's still faithful to the word that he spoke over your life, just like he did to David. And uh, if you'll just continue to be faithful, don't worry about who doesn't know you right now, or don't worry about the obscurity yeah. circumstances. Let God forge you. I really believe, Pastor, that God is going to be raising up a new, you were talking about the celebrity preachers and these things, but I really feel like God's going to raise up some new leaders in, uh, in, yeah. in the church, in the kingdom of God. Uh, you might not know their names right now, but they're being forged in the fires of obscurity, and they're going to come out with a strength and a power and a boldness, not to play those games, but to be bold voices for God. And uh, you know what? Just, just stay faithful where you are. Take advantage. You know, I was thinking of, we were talking earlier, Pastor, about David. You know, he was prepared for that moment with Goliath. Um, yeah. He, you know, he was a sniper with that slingshot. And it was being in the sheep field that gave him that, the, the opportunity. He took advantage of the opportunity. He was stuck out there. So he, he honed that skill and yeah. uh, made, him a, uh, made him like a, an assassin, a sniper with, with, with that slingshot. And I was thinking about Albert Einstein. You know, he, he was applying to so many universities to try to be uh, a professor. He kept getting rejected. He's working at a patent office, you know, which took no, like none of his brain power, you know, to, to, yeah. be, a, to be a clerk at a patent office. But while he was a clerk at the patent office, instead of just sinking into the role of obscurity, he started using his extra time to develop the, uh, what became known as relativity. And uh, that is, it just turned the whole idea of gravity on its head. It was, uh, it was groundbreaking. And then everybody wanted him to be a professor at, at yeah. their universities. But it was the fact that he was taking advantage of who he was, where he was, while he was going where he's going. And uh, I just want to encourage yeah. you, if you feel like you're in a Joseph moment, Come on, where you are is not your final address. If you feel yeah. like you're in a David Wilderness moment, it's not where it's not where you're going to end up. But you've got to stay faithful and don't reject the waiting. Amen. And you know, you're talking about being faithful. Um, I think about that with Joseph, and I think um, Joseph, he he was in a prison cell, and all he had his sphere of leadership influence. What's a prison cell? It's maybe. 10 foot by 10 foot. So his sphere of influence was 10 foot by 10 foot. Now we know Joseph learned how to be a slave. We know that David, sorry, Joseph learned how to be, um, you know, faithful over in Potiphar's house. He was, he started by cleaning mm -hmm. and yet he was so faithful in that moment. Like you said, where you are today is not your ultimate address that his faithfulness promoted him. And the Bible says about this young man called Joseph, that he was so good at what he did that Potiphar never paid attention to anything mm -hmm. Joseph did. He put him in charge of all his house. And the same thing's true about the prison ward. When he ended up in prison, he was so good at what he did. He didn't create, he didn't demand to be a leader. He created a demand for his leadership. That's good. And I just think, let God do the promoting. Amen. And then finally, good. like, Imagine the prison warden walking in one day. This is my anointed imagination, if you'll permit me. And he looks at Joseph, and Joseph learned how to clean. So his spirit leadership is 12, 10 foot by 10 foot. So he goes, well, I can't control everything that's happening in the prison, but where I am will be clean. So he starts cleaning it. And then maybe one day the prison warden walks in and he goes, don't you like a dirty cell? We're not, you're not just going to clean your cell and the bars that you're in but I'm going to get you to clean this entire wing. And I think to myself, anointed imagination, Amen. Joseph thinks my sphere of leadership is increasing. Maybe what the prison warden thought was a punishment mm -hmm. to teach him, you know, some humility. Joseph went, well, look what he's putting me in. And the Bible says, think about this, Brad. Think about this. You're talking to people about, don't be discouraged in a moment. If you'll just be faithful in the moment of where you are, let God, do, let God do the promoting. He literally went, God, you're increasing my sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. And God put him in charge. The Bible says that this prison warden put him in charge of the entire prison. Now, that doesn't mean the prisoners. It means the prison. He was so good at what he did that he was promoted beyond. He was a prisoner. And I think that's so true about you and I. If you're going to be flipping burgers at McDonald's, be the, you best. Be the best burger flipper you can be, right. and God will promote you. That's right. 
uh, you know, even David, after he killed Goliath, I was reading today, Pastor, just in preparing for to actually what, what we do is in the mornings when taking the boys to school, we're like, all right, what part of the Bible we're going to listen to? We just listen to it on, 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 uh, on Bluetooth and the audio Bible. And, to, and my youngest son's like, let's listen to David and Goliath. I'm like, all right, we're going to be talking with Pastor Steve about David tonight. So we turned it on and yeah, I just kept listening and uh, just kind of refreshing that whole story. But even after he becomes, um, after that day, he joins the military. The Bible talks yeah. about his successes and how he handled the men. And yeah. uh, it's like Saul was not only upset that the people were singing praises about David, but it's like he goes on to like nothing that he, everything you put him in charge of, he was faithful with the men. He was faithful in battle. And yes. He's, he had a proven track record. And uh, I think that's so critical because uh, I, had, I had a gentleman tell me one time years ago, he said, uh, as a minister friend and a mentor, he, he said that, you know, even in ministry, you've got to build a track record. You know, yeah. uh, people are going to trust when they see a track record. And, and what you think that there is that the people sung, Saul has killed thousands, David, but David. David has killed tens of thousands. And you're absolutely right. And then here's a thought. David, I mean, if you read through the life of David, the Bible says that God was with him everywhere he went. Mm -hmm. God, he won. He was victorious in so many battles. And listen, here's a great thought for all of us in leadership. We have to be so careful that as we handle success, that we don't allow success to pollute us. Mm -hmm. Because let's talk about that moment. We're talking about David killing Goliath. But let's talk about David was never broken in battle but it was not going to battle that broke David. It's true. It's very true. That's so good. That's right. And, um, you know, we know the story of David and Bathsheba. And the Bible says it was a time when kings go to war, but David didn't go to war. He said, Joab. Mm -hmm. And boy, that's on a whole nother story in and of itself about the different people in David's life. But he sat that war out. You know, Brad, for you and I, um, as leaders, there, there's a time when we go to war. And we can't afford to delegate. We can't afford to get bored with our success. David stayed home when he should have been in battle. And it was him staying home that led him into the sin of Bathsheba, which ended up in adultery and eventually murder. murder. And right. one of the dangers I think we learn from the life of David is, you know, David said, I want to build God a house. And God goes, David, check yourself. Stop thinking you're all that. I did this for you. And I think God was almost warning him. I see what's going to come to you. And you have to make sure that you don't just think it's all what you've done. It's what I've done through you. And David was a conqueror. He was a warrior like we talked about. And when you are not doing what God's called you to do, there's something you will conquer. There's something you will fight for. And yet in him, was the DNA of God. And I love David because at the end of all this, the Bible still calls David a man after God's own right. heart. The Bible, and it's like God's forgiveness and God's grace. Amen. Immeasurable in this whole story. But in that moment, we learn something. There's some phone calls that only we should make. There are some conversations and we can't delegate those things to other people. We must go to war. That's right. And where we miss God, is when we get bored with our success, when we get familiar with the blessing of God. And I think that is one of the greatest. See, if you're successful and you have a bad temper, why change? Right. And I think God was challenging David in that moment. Be careful that success doesn't pollute you. Right. You stop doing the little things that make you great. And you know, if it took little things to make you great, it's going to take, keep those things are, are still necessary to keep you, to keep you great because it keeps you honest. It keeps you accountable. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I wrote this down. There are dangers to staying behind. David stayed behind and there right. is it's dangerous to, you know, we get so blessed in our company if we're a business person that we stop doing what made us successful. Right. We start resting on our laurels. We start let and there's a danger to staying behind. And then I wrote down, uh, David was too young to retire and yet was too easily bored. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it was a time when Kings go to war yeah. and we, I, I wrote this thought that, you know, downtime 
isn't all it appears. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get like that. And uh, I wrote this thought, boredom is your enemy. That's true. <laughs> That's right. Well, I think he, 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 he had reached such a level of success that he, his military might was so powerful. He was going to win. His military was going to win whether or not he was there or not. Yes. Still, it's the personal exercise of doing the things that God's called you to do. And when there's an anointing on your life for something, and in his case, it was, he was a warrior king, when you're anointed for something, you've, that anointing is there to, to, to fuel your success and to keep your success. And it's like yeah. what you're saying is boredom almost turns that anointing off. And when that anointing's turned off, that's when the flesh can come out in ways that can bring you down. Like and his, public success and a domestic failure. Oh, yes. And I, I have this thought about you, we've got to establish everybody, no matter who's watching tonight, whoever's watching, if you're a, a married man, a married woman, if you're a business person, if you're a scientist, if you're an educator, if you're in medicine, if you're an athlete, we have got to establish patterns that will keep us moving forwards and productive at all times. And that's what David didn't do in that moment. Right. And then your work ethic will have more. I love this thought. Your work ethic will have more to do with your success than your gifts. Mm, it's, true. it's true. Wow. Well, it's kind of like, Pastor, I mean, you know this uh, well from your, this, the kind of staff that you have and um, being around leadership college and developing leaders is that, uh, and I've had to learn this over the years too, want to teach this to my children and to others is that, hey, you know what, you can have talent all day, but you have to have capacity. <laughs> yes. You can invest in talented people and that's all that they are, but their capacity for something great, greater is not there. And it doesn't matter what their dream or aspiration is. If that capacity is lacking, then yeah. uh, the talent can only take you so far. You know, um, it's one of my greatest m moments for me, Brad, just, you know, is God, please let me, I, you know, I love what, you know, David said, Lord, I want to make you great. And at the end of David's life, and we can talk a lot about Joab and the different people and, and David in his fugitive moment. But when David became king, because he wasn't willing to confront his kids, mm. um, I mean, dear God, where do we start? Which son do you want to pick? Mm. Uh, because he wasn't, you know, he got successful, but he wouldn't continue to confront his family. That the thing, I, I love this thought. This is a great thought that um, we're meant to pass on to the next generation a legacy. And I love what the Bible says about David at the end of his life. But the Bible says David served his generation by the will of God and he fell asleep. But what I think what's a great moment for us to reflect on is David did serve his generation by the will of God. And the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. And yet look at his children and his children were jacked up. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be that guy that actually I've done what God's called me to do, but I didn't pass my faith on to the next generation. Right. Well, and to do greater things. And we know about Solomon. We know about Absalom. We know about um, different sons that David had. And David, because he wasn't willing to deal with leadership challenges in his lifetime, caused Solomon to have to deal with things in his lifetime that David should have dealt with. Right. Boy, what a challenge that is. It is. You know, he was a great father to the nation, but a poor father to his own children. And, yes, you are. And that could have been uh, too, Pastor, as a result of, you know, obviously his success was so great, the demands of that on him. But, you know, his early stages of, um, there's always been that, I know you said you, you, you were a student of David. Maybe you can elaborate on this, but there's been a lot of uh, thoughts about David may, uh, the strained relationship with his father. You know, he wasn't called to the uh, prayer meeting that day when Samuel came to anoint one of the sons. He was left out in the sheep field. Some have even said he may have been a son of a concubine of Jesse. Yep. There's been all kinds of speculations as to, as to uh, 
uh, being the youngest, maybe pushed, uh, pushed aside after, because he had seven other brothers ahead of him. So maybe he had a, uh, a strained relationship with his father that, and then he goes on hoping to have a mentor in Saul. And obviously that was more than strained. So he never had, maybe he missed, lacked that father figure in his life that really did not bode well for him being able to be the kind of father to his own children, which was really his undoing. You know, you think of all the successes and even God's restoration in his life, he still died broken over his broken family. You know, Brad, you um, come from a, a father who's been in ministry and you've inherited what your dad has passed on to you. That's not my story. Um, if um, I think about, we have to be so careful like for me, I have to be careful. I don't have an orphan's heart because I didn't have a father that, I mean, my father was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Your father was a preacher. And what you're talking about there, I had this old saying, and I think it's so true. What walks in the father runs in the family. That's good. That's so um, and I just think to myself, you're right. You're absolutely right. I have, I personally am of the conviction that David um, was a illegitimate son of Jesse. That's why Jesse never even got him when the prophet came. Mm -hmm. And we think about when Samuel, the prophet, saw Abinadab and Eliab and all these other brothers, that he went, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. And yet God said to Samuel, no, 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 no. You're looking at the outer appearance. I'm looking at the heart. And then finally Samuel said, have you got any other sons? And Samuel went, well, sorry, Jesse went, well, there's David and go get him. And then the Lord said, arise anoint. and anoint. And I, here's the thought. Hey, Brad, can I share this? Please. When, when, when the Lord spoke to Samuel about, hey, I've got a new king. I've rejected Saul. Listen to this. I haven't preached this in a long time, but it just came to me as we're talking. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn over Saul mm -hmm. saying, I've rejected him. Get your oil and go. And this is the story about I've, been, I've chosen someone from Jesse's tribe. And I think to myself, when we get disappointed in leaders, we can get paralyzed and stop moving forwards. Mm -hmm. But isn't God gracious? He gives us time to mourn yes. over the failure of leaders Right. And God said, how long will you mourn? In other words, God's going, okay, this has been long enough, Samuel. I understand you're disappointed. I know you anointed him. I know I told you to anoint him. I know the people wanted him. But now, if you don't get up and go, you will not anoint another generation. Right. That's good. Get, your, get up, get your oil, and go. And sometimes we can use the excuse, well, I was hurt by this person. I was disillusioned by that. And God understands that. I'll give you time to grieve, but come on. There's an, get your, there's another generation. There's more I have to do and tell your story, get over it, but get up and go. Amen. You know, it kind of reminds me of Elijah after the day of Mount Carmel and all that happens. And then he's, then he runs, yeah. God lets him run. And in fact, he, the angels bring him food to sustain him for 40 days. I mean, they gave him super food to get him, <laughs> they yeah. God lets him run. He lets him hide in the cave. He lets him get it out, cry it out. And then God tells him, go and anoint Elisha to be your replacement. Yeah. Go and anoint Jehu to be the king of Israel. So we have to turn the page in our life from failures to step in to the anointing of the next season. And I think that's so important. What David did, Pastor, you're talking about he has a man for God's own heart. Even after heinous sins and crimes, we see that when he was confronted, he ran to the altar and, and he ran to God. And that's such a contrast when you look at like Adam and Eve, they ran from God, you know, they ran yeah. hid from God um, and, and they were, they were inevitably cast out of their place. But David was on the, he was on the verge of being cast out of, off his throne. But the difference was his heart still came through in failure and he ran to God for restoration. And what a contrast between when Samuel anointed Saul to be the king of Israel Versus when Samuel anointed the king, David, to be king of Israel. So Samuel anointed Saul. And we know that Samuel, sorry, that Saul was not God's choice. It was the people's choice. So God says to Samuel, 
I want you to get, um, let me see if I got this right now, a flask of oil. Look it up. It's in there in the Hebrew. And in other words, a flask of oil is a man-made vessel that handles the oil. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is the people's choosing. It's not God's. And then when God said, you go and anoint David, get a horn of oh, oil. That's right. Which is a God-made instrument. That's right. And, and I love it because, that's oh, great. my gosh, think about Think about when um, Samuel sinned, and sorry, not Samuel, um, Saul sinned, mm -hmm. and Samuel comes to him and says, now, whatever you do, wait for me. Don't do anything. I'll come, and I'll give an, a, a sacrifice and an offering. And when Samuel didn't come, Saul made his own sacrifices, and he didn't obey the word of the Lord about kill everything, men, women, and children, spare nothing, and Samuel comes up to him and says, you know, did you do everything the Lord told you to do? And Saul goes, I've done everything. And then Samuel says, well, what's the sound of bleeding a sheep I hear? Right. And, and, what, and Saul, Saul tried to defend himself. Well, when I saw how valuable this was and how good it was, and he said, I've done everything the Lord told me to do. But Saul kept saying, I've done everything. And it's amazing how spiritual the flesh can sound. It's amazing how we can justify justify yeah. our wrong decisions. Right. And, and so Samuel's confronting Saul about his disobedience and Saul's defending himself. Mm -hmm. No, I wasn't real. And, and oh my gosh, think about this. Saul goes to the witch of Endor mm -hmm. and says, sum up Samuel because he's dead now. And I need to find out what the will of the Lord is. And Samuel goes, you didn't obey the Lord's command and you'll die today and your sons will die. Right now there's a confrontation of sin in that moment that Samuel said, you didn't obey the Lord. When Nathan confronted David, here's the difference. David was a murderer and adulterer. And if you weigh it up, you almost think, well, Saul didn't do quite as bad as David did, but he did. Saul was worse. Because when David was confronted with his sin, he didn't say, no, 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 no. David said, by Nathan, I have sinned. Mm. What? That's the difference, isn't it? That's right. And, um, you know, it's interesting. Samuel told Saul rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, right? Yes. And once you allow rebellious spirit, it, 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 it leads to that slippery slope because Notice what happens, Pastor. He, he's rebellious in, to, in the to the instructions that God, I love what you said uh, one time, Pastor. I think it was in this teaching. You said, don't interpret, obey. He yes. was interpreting what he thought. Well, and it was really, I don't know. He was just justifying himself like you were saying. But it's interesting. Samuel says, uh, uh, rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. And what happens? Just a couple chapters later, he spirals out of control. So now he's actually consorting with a witch. Right. And, and, and that that's the man, that, that, that's the manifestation of that rebellion. And he's actually consorting now. He's, yeah, he's, and see, his, I, love, I, love this, I love this thought. Denial is a lead you to deceit. Mm -hmm. That's true. So, so he's denying. I did everything the Lord called me to do. And now he's deceiving himself. Uh, Saul. Sorry. He's deceiving Samuel. <clears throat> Samuel. But then he's deceiving the witch. Right. And when we live in denial, and I love what Samuel said, Samuel goes, obedience is better than sacrifice. Right. Yeah. yeah. Amen. <clears throat> you know, the Bible says that when, when Samuel uh, confronted Saul and he said, the kingdom is torn from you this day. It says that, uh, and he said, and he's given to a man. Now, I love the language there, Pastor. To a man who's yeah. better than you or to a neighbor of yours, who's better than you. And this individual he's talking to was about 15 at the time. Yep. Right. So it just goes to show you when God looks on your heart, he isn't looking at your age or experience level. He's looking at that part of you that he needs to use. Yes. His plan. And uh, David was only 15, but he was already considered in the eyes of God, a better man. Yeah. So, so true manhood, true, true uh, um, the true calling of God is measured not by the age, but it's measured by the heart. And Bray, can I say something about that? Um, what you just said there just made me think about that when, God's an, when God anoints you, which he did, David, 
Mm -hmm. And Samuel anointed him. That anointing makes you look better than you really are. Come on. <laughs> and, and, and you got to be so careful. Again, you don't get caught up in the success of it. Right. But it will cause, that anointing will cause other people to despise you. Well, that's true. And David's own wife, Michael. Now, there's a whole story there. <laughs> I don't have time to get into that story. Um, um, let alone some of David, some of the things that David didn't confront. Um, but we have to be careful. Sometimes we personalize and we, we feel like someone's hating on us mm -hmm. and we are hating us. They're not hating us. They're hating the anointing. They're jealous. That's right. Of what, and, and we have to be careful. We don't, we don't think we're all, we're better than anybody else. Cause David could have. Oh yeah. Um, and, and David in that moment, when, when his wife said, you dance before the handmaids, the headmaidens, and you, you know, you took off your kingly garments and David says, no, no, I wasn't dancing before them. It was before the Lord. Who chose and, me over your father. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. <laughs> and then he also realized that the Bible says that Michael, his wife despised him. Mm -hmm. his own heart, but it wasn't him. It was actually um, the anointing of God. And sometimes every leader is going to face people who despise you and we can make it about us. It's not about you. It's about the anointing that God's put in your life. Right. That's right. You know, it's interesting, Pastor. Even though Saul was gone, long gone at that point, he was still battling the spirit of Saul in yeah. his own home because the Bible says in that moment that when he came, it refers to Michal as the daughter of Saul, not the wife of David. You know, she carried his spirit. Boom! Right. She carried the spirit of her father, even though her father had passed on. So David was still battling Saul in his own wife. And, and think about that. So David, um, the Bible says Michael loved David. Right. But he could never grow beyond being the king's little princess. Well, it says the wife of a king. We were reading that today, Pastor. And I just read over that again. It just stuck out. It really struck me because it said Saul encouraged uh, Mike, uh, Michael to, to marry him. He said he wanted to... Uh, um, how, how's the, how did the scripture put it? It was really, he wanted to entice that. He wanted to in, ensnare. So I think he used the word ensnare. He actually yeah. encouraged that marriage to ensnare David. Yeah. What, what man would not want to your daughter to be marrying the man of her dreams? What father right. wouldn't be your daughter, but he used it. He used the love that he saw that Michael had for David to his own advantage. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, you know, in marriages, hey, how many times have we seen somebody be want to be daddy's little girl and never actually end up marrying? They marry somebody, but they never grow up beyond being daddy's little girl. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that tension in a marriage where the marriage ends up in disaster because mm -hmm. the husband goes, she never cut the strings from a father. Right. And that happens the other way as well. But um, she could never grow past wanting to be daddy's princess rather than the queen of a king. That's right. That's good. Which was David. Praise God. And, um, you know, when David, the Bible says that when Samuel told him that the kingdom has been stripped from you today uh, and given to a, an, another a neighbor of yours who's better than you, it, it, when Sam, it's, it's so it's so interesting, Pastor. It's like when you read where when you were talking earlier, where he took the horn of oil and anointed David. The Bible says the Spirit of God came upon David from that day forward. Yes. And in the next page, the very first line of the next chapter says, "And a distressing spirit came upon Saul." It's like, you yeah, know, one one exits Saul, uh, Saul's life, and the torment comes, and that spirit comes on David. And yeah. You know, I just want to encourage those watching, just stay faithful. And the anointing, God knows where I told my, you know, pastor told my children today, the last words I gave them before we, I dropped them off to school because we were just listening to David's story in the audio Bible. I said, guys, look, God will find you in the sheep field. Favor will find you. Come on. Your courage, but it takes your courage to have success in battle. I said, but once you have success, be ready because your enemies will come. You know, yes. favor will find you, your courage will bring your success, but success will bring out your enemies. And yeah. you've got to, you, even in the moment when you're facing your enemies, you've got to stay faithful. Amen. That's Amen. what happened to Jesus. 
Jesus, when he was baptized, was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the enemy. Um, your calling will introduce you to your enemy. <laughs> Every time, man. Come on. It does indeed. Well, uh, I just want to say this, Pastor, and I'll let you close it out with the last word. I, I just want to uh, encourage somebody that's watching today. You know, when you read the David and Goliath story, it's the one that everybody knows, right? But there's something yeah. so fascinating about that story. It says that David, uh, Saul wanted to know who, what, who was it that went out there and killed the, the giant. And they brought David back before Saul. And it says, Pastor, that he, that he was still holding. He chopped the head. He decapitated Goliath. And it says when they brought him before Saul that he was still holding the head of the giant. Yeah. It's as you read on, the thing that is so amazing is that he goes to this stronghold of Jebus, which was a Jebusite stronghold. And the Bible says that he tacked the head before yeah. that day was out. This is so powerful. He tacked the head of Goliath on the walls of Jebus. And for those yeah. of you who know what Jebus is, it's, it was where Jerusalem is today. Yeah, Joshua and Caleb came into the land. It was a Jebusite stronghold that they never took. It was still yep. from all those centuries to David. It was still a Jebusite stronghold, but David knew he had a destiny. Even in the sheep fields, he had a destiny and his destiny was to be the king and rule from that place. And so in a prophetic act of faith, he takes that head. And that's the, that's so amazing. He wasn't just defeating his enemy that day, pastor. He was making a proclamation about his future Man. that you know what, I'm going to take this place. I'm going to take this city. And today it was called the city of David because uh, of what he did. And, and I want to encourage you today that, you know what, you're facing some battles, but come on, fight that fight, be faithful because the battles you fight today and win are leading to some of your greatest moments ahead. And just keep speaking it, keep believing it and keep waking up every day, being faithful to what God called you to do and favor will find you and take you to places you ne you could never go on your own. Amen. Amen. I love it. I I, I see the pause and think on that. Well, you go ahead and pastor just close us out with a with a word and a prayer, if you will. I mean, what last words you have to people tonight that are listening, wanting to learn how to have a life of success and following God. Well, I just want to say, uh, what what caused Dave caused God to speak so well of David was when God said, Samuel, you're looking at the outer appearance, but I look at the heart. Mm. And end of David's life, the epithet, epithet that God gave was David was a man after my own heart. Mm. And I just want to say, let's have a heart for God. God. David served his own generation by the will of God. And I'll close with this thought. I love this. David said, I was, all, I was young and now I'm old. But God... I've never seen the righteous forsaken Amen. or his children for, uh, begging bread. Amen. And then he said in Psalm, I think it's 75. He goes, Lord, 71. Lord, please don't let me die before I declare your power to the next generation. And I think in any regard of David, maybe that's where David missed all that God would have loved for David to do. And, but David had a, David, more than anybody else in the Old Testament, had prophetic vision of the future of the New Testament. No question. And yet, I love what David said, and I think this is true for you and I. God, please, be, when I'm, be, before I'm old and great, don't let me go before I've declared your power to the next generation. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, you know, it's a simple formula in life. Just... Get up every day, be faithful, go to bed and do it over and over again. And uh, I just want to encourage you that if you're not faithful, do the last thing that God put in your life to do. Wow. Be able to have the success with the next thing. You can try to yeah. make it happen, but you got to be faithful with the last thing. Yeah. You can be given the success of the next thing. So, uh, Pastor, we love you so much, brother. We love Pastor Sharon and the Kellys and Wave Church and all that you guys are doing we're so delighted to be connected and hey, we're, we're excited. We're going to be mobile. Come on. We're going to be bringing Pastor Steve and Pastor Sharon in 2021. And uh, we're looking forward to that. And I, 
I, I have a witness sitting right beside me. But before we went live, Pastor Steve said I was going to Australia with him. I just want to say that that you are. Uh, I have a living witness that I'm. I'm <laughs> you just, but, hey, I would. I there's nothing I look forward to more than going with you to Australia and preaching across that great country. It's a great nation. Well, you don't have to tempt me to preach. I love to preach and I love to travel and, uh, and uh, hey, and you know what? The Tim Tam Slam. So, you know, all those wonderful things about Australia. So, Pastor, we love you, sir. God bless you. Well, you want to close us out with prayer and pray for um, those that are watching? Yep. Lord, I thank you yes. for all that you're doing. And I thank you, Lord, your kingdom is advancing. Amen. I thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign that you're in control of COVID. Amen. You're in control, Lord. Your word says that promotion does not come from the north or the south, the east or the west, but you are the judge. Yes. You set one down and you exalt another. Right. Lord, whilst in America, at least here in the United States, we live in a country that has a democracy. At the end of it all, Father, you are in control. The heart of the king is in the hand of a Lord. And I thank you, Father, that in it all and through it all, you are sovereign and you lead our nation. And I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you set one down and you exalt another. And Lord, we look to you. We acknowledge, we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Where faith is not in politics, our faith is not in science or even in medicine. We thank you for it all. But, Lord, our faith is in you. You are Jehovah Jireh. You, our Lord, have the heart of the king in your Amen. hand. And we pray for your blessing on the United States of America. We pray for revival. Yes, we Lord. pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, for unity in the body of Christ. We pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, the church would be strong. Amen. Lord, that we would be united in faith to see your kingdom come, your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pastor, thank you so much. And we appreciate your insights and wisdom tonight. And uh, you all have a Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year in Virginia Beach. We love you guys so much, Brad. Thank you for the honor to be with you tonight. I'm cheering you on. Well, thank you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. Sir. Sure.